<clears throat> Thank you, Margo. Margo. Good, Good morning. Welcome to Kennewick First United Methodist Church. I'm Jim Dethridge. I'll be your liturgist this morning. We have some housekeeping things to kind of take care of here today. Um, if we uh, needed to evacuate this building, this part of the building, uh, during service, there's a door back there, a door here, and a door there, and we have ushers all around who uh, will help guide us so we don't, you know, not everybody runs the same door. So follow your ushers. They know what's going on. If you have, uh, you need medical assistance or you someone in your row or near you, you can raise the card, and our ushers, again, are watching. If they see that, they'll come over and assist. You have a black pad, Ritual of Friendship, in your pew there. If you haven't uh, taken and signed it, uh, do so, please, and then pass it down uh, back and forth. There's prayer request cards in there. Uh, you can make notes on that, too. So uh, all things to... We're a busy church. The bulletin will show you that. We're a busy church, but that's a good thing to have. Um, the new upper room devotionals are available in the back by the usher station. Uh, they're cheap and they're good, and it's a good way to start your day. So I highly recommend the upper room. It's available back there. Uh, I've been asked to give a uh, quick... <clears throat> excuse me. After we get... Through a service downstairs, we have coffee fellowship. You're certainly welcome to be involved in that. And today, of course, we have communion. I have uh, been asked by the safety security uh, team to make an announcement on some updates to keep you posted of what's going on, etc. Uh, we wish we lived in a different world than we do, but we don't. Uh, and so we're trying to make this as a safe and secure place as we can have it. And I'm just going to read this to you rather than try to uh, just tell you. We've implemented some simple changes to address our safety and security, and more will be forthcoming as we work out the most efficient manner to uh, implement them. We ask for your patience and your cooperation as we, as we move toward further enhancing our church's safety and security. One example uh, is uh, adding door locks. Uh, we've added locks to three doors downstairs in Wesley Hall. Hi, little pea. <laughs> Uh, we've added three locks downstairs to uh, help uh, keep our, uh, that, that area safe from somebody coming in. Our lock door policy is going to be updated, and letter of vigilance will be forthcoming regarding the locking of church doors when using our church. But for now, until that policy is uh, implemented, okay, et cetera, it's important to emphasize that if you're using our church, you're responsible for locking the door behind you, not just when you leave. Frankly, our church can be a whirlwind of activity day and night, and many folks have keys to the church. And unless we're careful, we risk leaving our church open to intruders. Again, our church is busy, which is a blessing, but there is a lot of non-church traffic that passes our church during the day and during the night. So the bottom line is, if you open the door, lock it behind you. Okay? Expect more specifics on our church after our church council addresses this situation. Our committee will also be coordinating with the ushers, already have done so, and the youth ministries to uh, ensure that we're making the best use of our radios and uh, that we have available. And this is a simple communication step that we are already putting into use. And finally, we will soon have a one-page incident report form available in our lobby area and in the church office. This form will help us record and address safety security needs as they arise. For example, if at Soul Soup we have a disturbance, that incident needs to be written up and turned into the office or to Jerry or to any safety security team member so that we can address that situation. And if you have questions, you feel free to ask uh, people on the committee, uh, Jerry included. Okay? Whew. Call to worship. As we sit in the sanctuary this morning and uh, come to offer our praise and love to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I'm just going to throw out a few one-liners, and one of these one-liners is, is going to hit you. It's going to be something that you, uh, that you can take with you for the rest of the week. Pray all the time, and if necessary, use words. God forgets the past. Imitate him. Greed we often regret, but generosity never. Don't ask God to do what you want. Ask God to do what is right. Fear and worry make you forget who really is in charge. No one is useless to God. No one. 
Nails didn't hold Christ to the cross. Love did. God is listening for your answer. Will you come? Our good shepherd knows us, and he calls us by name. What's your answer when he asks, who do you think I am? And you will never forgive anyone more than God has already forgiven you. Good morning. Let's begin together by singing. How's that? more than I hear us. Although I like hearing us. Isn't it nice to have Forrest with us this morning? Yes. Cool. 
please take a few minutes and greet those around you. Good morning. Happy Cinco de Mayo. I wonder if you've all been going to Cinco de Mayo events this weekend. I wonder. You know, last year and the year before, we would be thinking about Cinco de Mayo when we were uh, wrapping up the rummage sale because it always happened during Cinco de Mayo weekend. Some of you are not exhausted and sore because we didn't have one this year. So your shoulders, your muscles, you must feel better. But we do have this opportunity to help out those in the community with the stuff that we want to uh, share with them. And you have that note in the bulletin. Please be sure and read that, that our our uh, trailer that we're going to fill with treasures is supposed to arrive on Tuesday and we'll be here for seven days. I'm hoping to leave half the books of my um, study library in there, but of course if that's going to happen, I actually have to go through those books and make a decision on every single one of them to keep, to, keep, to give away, to write, the, uh, to write the author, who knows. So, it's great to be here with you today. We've had a very interesting, um, we have had a very interesting week. Somebody was commenting to me about something that I had planned to do on this past Friday at lunchtime, and I couldn't do it because we were busy struggling with our email system in the office. Our email in and out has been dead since last uh, Wednesday night. Dead is kind of a special term. <laughs> to me, it's dead. And we hope that it will be alive when I check it out this afternoon. But on the other hand, if it's not, we're, we're still, we're still, our hearts are still breathing. Email has its limitations. We're hoping to get that, uh, that, that problem solved. We hope. Um, we want to keep uh, Justin and Kimmy in our prayers. Justin and Kimmy were married here in this church yesterday afternoon in the sanctuary, and that was a fun wedding. 
Um, I'll have to tell you more about that later. And we want to remember to uh, keep in our prayers the people who are participating or working the uh, Walk with Christ weekend in Connell, the men's Walk with Christ weekend that's going on right now. We know that uh, Dave Hare is working the walk this weekend, and, uh, and there may be others, but he's the one that I know of for sure. And uh, we want to keep those people in our prayers. Speaking of prayer, let's pray. Gracious God, we give thanks for the day and for the sunshine streaming through our windows, for the health that makes it possible for us to be here, gathered with our friends and neighbors in the body of Christ some of which we know and some of, some of whom we'll meet today. Bless and guide us through this hour. Help us to focus our attention upon you. We reflect back on the day or the week or the hour that's just passed, and we think about, we think about how we've been doing as your followers. And we ask, O oh God, that you help us to reflect on how we've been doing to give thanks for those times when we were found faithful and helpful and caring and compassionate. And we ask your forgiveness upon those times when we were, when we were not, when we were thinking more about ourselves instead of upon the opportunities that you place before us. We thank you that you are a God of forgiveness. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And the people said, Amen. I have to tell you what happened yesterday. I didn't see it, but I heard about it. I saw the before and the after, but I didn't see the during. In this wedding yesterday afternoon, this couple had, when I came in the afternoon, in the afternoon for the wedding, there were down the center aisle on this side and on this side, there were these little white things that looked like flower petals, only they weren't, because of course flower petals are not allowed because they're so hard to clean up. But it was something else, and we finally decided that it was some kind of synthetic thing that looks like flower petals. And they were all down the aisle, and I thought, Oh, that's an interesting idea. And then, and so the wedding happened. It was lovely and interesting. They're always interesting. And they're always unique. Um, and then afterwards, when I came back in, uh, not too long before our um, Saturday Night Live service, and... I was wandering through here checking on uh, another detail from the wedding and I looked up the aisle and I saw everything was all cleared out and then some news came to me. I realized that Phyllis, our wedding coordinator, had just left a few minutes before and it was a 2.30 wedding. Why would she spend all afternoon in this sanctuary? And then I found out that, that and she hasn't talked to me about this, she'll probably kill me that I'm telling you, but here I am. Um, Phyllis and her grandson, Cooper, picked up, and Cooper was counting, and he counted over 2,000 of those. And I don't know if they actually took all afternoon to clean up, but we, we need to boost her compensation a lot. Anyway, take some liniment or something to Phyllis for whatever may be aching her. Um, where are they? Kathy Bryson has a message. Where did Kathy Bryson go? There she is. Kathy Bryson has a message for you. I want to make sure you hear it. Hi, thank you, Jerry. I've got actually got a couple things. So um, you might remember us. <laughs> we we actually live um, yeah, part time uh, here and also part time down in Southern California. And uh, we just got back into town y yesterday for the, for the season through, um, through fall. But while we were gone, a few things happened. Uh, one of the things that happened, and for those of you that know that we've been involved in disaster response, 
that Dana and I were named by our conference as the disaster response coordinators. So, so what does that mean? That more means, work, more work. More work. It means that sometimes <laughs> it's hard to say no is what it means. But um, you can't say no to a mission like this. And what that means is if there is a disaster, if there is a tornado, for example, in Port Orchard, uh, if there is a flood in Idaho County, which is part of our conference, that we are the point of contacts to help coordinate those responses for our church. It means that we will go to the local pastor to make sure that their, the congregation is okay. It means that we will be available to the counties, to the state, um, for any kind of response and representing our, our, um, our, our church. Uh, the other thing it means is if there are disasters beyond our borders, that it is in other conferences and other jurisdictions, that we're the point of contact uh, for the jurisdictions to reach out to us for help. For example, we just did that in November when we had three teams that deployed back to um, North Carolina, to Beaufort, to help um, with Hurricane Florence. Uh, the second thing that happened that it's hard to say no to is that while we were down in Southern California, our counterpart from the California Pacific Conference reached out to, to actually to me and said, you know, we, we, have, uh, we have a need for support uh, for, her, for Typhoon U2, which is, uh, happened in Saipan in October of last year. And uh, essentially uh, what happened is I became the project coordinator uh, to pull together teams to serve in, in Saipan. Uh, and Dana was the, the third team that went in. The first team that went in uh, was in March. And we just got news that we're going to continue to support with relief efforts in Saipan through the end of the year and possibly beyond. And this is in coordination with, with FEMA. Um, the other thing that happened uh, while we were gone was that there was the flood I mentioned over in Idaho County. And we are preparing now to send uh, ERTs over there to help support for that. In fact, we have one of our congregation uh, members, Mike Thien, is going to be going over and helping out uh, this week to, uh, to help muck out houses over there. And can I say something about this? Sure. But tell them, for the people who may be brand new, tell them what ERT is. Early response teams. And you know those cool trailers that you have out there? Those were actually the first, tra uh, the first trailers that were, were put together to help support uh, our teams. An early response team goes in uh, to a disaster area after a first responders leave and before the rebuild starts. And we, uh, we prevent further damage by making homes safe, sanitary, and secure. Uh, the other thing that I, I picked this up and read this, and mm -hmm. it just really mm -hmm. rang a bell. So this, um, uh, this mission, the bump mission in, uh, in, uh, in Montana, are, is, is, is a fascinating mission. Last year, there was um, significant snow that hit this area. And the, the Reverend Calvin Hill was the point of contact that worked with, along with my counterpart in, in that area, uh, through an UMCOR grant. And they actually uh, brought in truckloads of wood. Uh, the folks that got stranded by this uh, out in, on the reservation uh, couldn't leave to get wood. They're uh, dependent on firewood. They're dependent on food. And an UMCOR grant came in and bought uh, uh, truckloads of firewood that volunteers uh, uh, chopped up and then took out. They actually took them out on calving, calving, calving sleds. If you all, any, anybody has ever done, worked with cab, cattle. Anyway, they took them out on snowmobiles and delivered firewood and food out here to the reservation folks. So this, this is an amazing mission. I just, I was really glad to see it in today's bulletin. So anyway, I ask for your prayers for all of, um, not only our Methodist volunteers that are out serving people, but also our other partners as well. There are Mennonites, the Mennonite Southern Baptist, um, uh, the uh, World Renew, there's other organizations that we serve alongside as well. So I ask for your prayers for all volunteers. Kathy's got so much in her head that she didn't mention that we're giving a training uh, this weekend for certification for ERTs. And I'd like people to think about joining this mission and participating. And uh, we will have future trainings. It's not just about the strong backs that go in and rip up floors and rip out walls. It's also about people participating in call centers and working with survivors there's a wealth of mission opportunities. So please consider that. Thank you. And when is that next training, Dana? Well, the, the training is up at the Lazy F. 
Okay. Um, starting Friday Sat and Friday Saturday. Friday and Saturday. But it, that's, that's pretty much locked up okay. now. But we will do You can do more. another one. If people are interested, we will accommodate. Okay. Thank you, Dana. Yes. Sure, they can e yeah, email us. Yeah, email us. <laughs> Let's take a moment for our own um, silent prayers. Let's enter the silence. Oh God, you hear our prayers, and we want to listen to you. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. What are we doing now? We're going to welcome a new member. Let us bring forth our new member, Lene, and her sponsor. Susan, why don't you introduce our new member? I'd like to introduce Lene Wright, who has come to us from Yakima, where she taught elementary and middle school for 41 years, retired, moved here to be close to her son and help with his family. Many of you already know her because she's pretty actively involved in several things in the church, liturgist, um, UMW, and she's a crafter with our crafting group. Please welcome her. I can hold this. Yes, it feels like you're you're already very much a part of us. I remember it was group. it was it was a while ago. It was a year a year or more ago that Lene came to a new member class and she she passed. <laughs> she passed the new member class. And then she said to me, well, I'm not going to join officially yet. I'm just going to get involved. So she did get involved. And then she got around to deciding, well, maybe I should join the yes. church. That's a great you, place to then be. Then you could vote, in, vote on important matters. Yes. <laughs> so we have questions of faith. Here they are. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? And if so, say, I do. I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? I do. And according to the grace given to you, Will you continue to be a faithful member of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representative in, to, in the world? If so, say, I will. I will. And a question for your sponsor. Will you, Susan, who sponsors this candidate, support and encourage her in her Christian life? If so, say, I will. I will. All right, good. For the congregation. <laughs> Do you, as Christ's body of the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, say, we do. We do. We do. <laughs> Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include Lene now before you in your care? If so, Chuck is about to put something on the screen. Oh. <laughs> let, us, let us read that. With God's help. We, we will proclaim, proclaim the good, good news and, and live, live according, according to the example of Christ. Of Christ. We, we will surround Lene with a community of love and forgiveness that she may grow in her service to others. We will pray for her that she may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. Is there more? Okay. All right, good. Very good. Let's have a prayer. Dear God, we give thanks for Lene, for her heart that you have given to her and for her willingness to serve and care and share her compassion with others. 
Help us to be alert to the ways that we might encourage her as she continues to seek to encourage us. We give thanks that she's joining our body. We pray in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Let us welcome her. Thank you very much. Our ushers are coming forward to receive our morning tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. So easy to take for granted. So easy to get caught up in things that really don't matter and forget to thank you for 
having us get up this morning. And thank you, Lord, for the people here who come to share their love for you and for each other. We just love you, Lord, and we just hope that these gifts that we give are, uh, are used to bring more people into your realm, into an understanding of you as the most important thing in their life. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Please remain standing while we sing. first scripture reading Acts 9 1 through 9 the conversion of Saul I read an interesting thing this week one of the Bible experts says he didn't consider it a conversion he considered it a surrender interesting meanwhile Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. 
Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you're per persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was out without sight and neither ate nor drank. The word of the Lord. And the story continues. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all those who invoke your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, for he is an instrument for whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul, and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. The word of the Lord. I think I'm only going to make a couple of observations on this text. I know some of you would be very stressed if I rolled into a traditional sermon right about now when we're going to have communion. You might have something going on in the next hour that could be interrupted. I want you to go with me in your imagination to a hot, dry, sandy, dusty place. The road to Damascus to Damascus, we think of as Damascus, Syria. I was not, have not ever been able to be in Damascus, but on my last trip to Israel 13 years ago, I do remember standing on a hillside with the rest of my group, and our guide was saying, look over there, see that city way over there? That's Damascus. It was across a border, and we were not going to go across that border though there was no wall. We were not going to go across that border on that day. We had too many places to go, but we saw where Damascus was. Now, I want you to imagine that Paul is on the way to Damascus. He may be riding a donkey. He might be riding a horse. He might be walking. He has people with him. Uh, he is um, um, a most respected man. Those of you who have read about him in the Bible know about all, all his resume has to say about him. A Roman citizen, a learned and educated man, a Pharisee, someone of great respect. And yet, he saw that it was his purpose to um, persecute the people who were following the way, that is, the way of the one who says, I am the way and the truth and the life. 
persecute, persecute, throw them in jail. In some cases, cooperate with their, with their being put to death. As we know, he was present when Stephen was stoned to death and Paul was guarding the cloaks and coats of people who were, had been working too hard stoning him and had to take their coats off because they were getting too warm. So Paul took care of their coats while they were stoning Stephen to death. You read about it in Acts chapter 6 or 7. What would cause a person, a person like Paul, to be so determined to go out and persecute people who were following someone who was a man of peace? What would cause that? Well, we may not be entirely certain, but we know that at least part of the reason was that Paul believed that Jesus was leading the people in a way that was not um, in concert with what they would read in what we would think of as our Old Testament, in the Pentateuch and the first five books of the Bible and in other particular areas of the Psalms and the prophets. In that area, if you were... If you were a good Jew in those days, you knew that there were something like 613 rules and regulations, and if you could find a way to follow them, which uh, a thoughtful person could, then you knew that you were going to find your way into uh, whatever would be God's good graces just by following the rules. And of course, we know that uh, Jesus eventually got impatient with Paul and his trouble he was making for the followers. And he finally said, enough of this. We need to turn him around to our way. He thinks he's following God and he's going in the wrong direction. What was at the core of all that? Some of you know also that at the core of that issue was that Paul needed a heart transplant. He was learning pretty well how to follow all the rules, but his heart was cold. There was no good circulation to his heart. And he didn't understand that Jesus was the one that was merely calling the people to have their own heart transplanted by the Holy Spirit, that they might love God and love their neighbor and maybe pay a little less attention to following the rigors of each rule they could find in the Old Testament. For if they were loving God and loving their neighbors, they wouldn't have to memorize all those rules anymore. They would just carry out a life of kindness and invite the Holy Spirit to transform them. It seems rather simple. The counterpoint, of course, is Ananias, who was... Uh, also one of the followers of the way, but he was the one that God called to go and uh, lay hands on Paul when he found his way into Damascus after he'd been walking in there and had been blind and had not eaten for three days. Imagine if you were the one that God called to go in and lay hands on and pray for someone who had been very busy persecuting and even being a part of the deaths of followers of Jesus' band of uh, disciples. Imagine if it was you or me. On a good day, I might have said, oh, he's out there in the desert and he's been struck blind. Leave him there. Let him stay there and maybe he'll starve to death and he won't be a problem for anybody anymore. Let's just leave him there. I don't think I've sold all of you on that. But God had other plans. He knew that Paul had been given tremendous abilities in leadership. And God, Father, Son, and Spirit decided it was time to turn Paul over to the good side. To the good side. And so it happened. This afternoon, I want you to think further about the character of the Apostle Paul and how he was transformed. Jim was already telling you earlier about this question, open question about whether he was converted or whether he surrendered. 
some would say he was already a follower of God. He just didn't know which rule book to follow, and he was following the wrong one, the wrong rule book. Which rule book, my friends, are we following? Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for Paul, for all that he endured before and after his changeover and his heart transplant. Help us not only to appreciate his sacrifice and his love and his servanthood, but help us to consider how we might invite God's further heart transplants. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now today, on this Cinco de Mayo, we have an opportunity to participate in the sacrament together. And so we will. And so we will. You are all invited to participate in this sacrament. Corin has baked this bread, and it is for us today. Sourdough, home-baked, and ready for us. If you're thinking about not participating today, if you're thinking that you may just not measure up, something happened, something you did recently, that you feel that um, somehow should disqualify you from Receiving this spiritual meal, I ask you to change your mind and join the others who will come forward to receive these elements. For there is no one who is beyond God's um, pardoning hand. In a few moments, we'll invite you to come down. We'll have come down the center aisle. We'll have two pairs of servers here to serve you. We hope that you will have your hands like this so we can place bread in your hands and then you can dip it in the chalice and partake of the elements. And return to your seats by way of the side aisles. We have over here a kneeling bench for those who would like to kneel for prayer before returning to their seats. We'll have a gluten-free station right there. Do you know why? Do you know why we ask you to put your hands like this so we can give you bread? The name of the game is generosity. Some of you think, it's oh, it's all about having clean hands and so forth. Well, maybe. But it's more a matter of generosity. We have learned that if you pick the bread off yourself, you will give yourself a little, a little teeny weeny. And then you dip it in the cup, and you have got practically nothing by the time it gets to your lips. And then some of you will think, oh, that's what I deserve, practically nothing. So we try to give you a more generous peace as a reminder that we worship a generous God. Sweet sound. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for your love and for your gifts. Among these great gifts is your son, Jesus, who you sent into the world to lead us and to love us and to take upon himself the sins of the world and take them all the way to the cross. We thank you that he was not defeated by the cross, but instead he was victorious and rose on the third day and now sits with you and intercedes for us all out of love. We thank you, O God, for these elements of bread and the cup. We ask you to set them aside for their special purpose on this day. We thank you for the church of which we are a part. Help us day by day to welcome and to become better acquainted with your family, the family of God, that we might all see how we are servants and soldiers together for your good causes. Bless us, we pray, and help us to be more and more united. We pray in Jesus' name, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. When our Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And said, take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And in the same manner also, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's for you, for the remission of sins. Drink of it, all of you. For as often as you eat the bread and drink from the cup, you remember the Lord's death until he comes again. The gifts of God for the people of God. Our servers may come forward. Let mercy draw. 